Welcome everyone to 11.3, the integral test. Now the integral test is gonna be our first really big theorem to help us determine when series are gonna converge or diverge. But it only works in certain situations. So we have to go through and we have to understand the hypotheses and the conclusion of the integral test. So we have to make sure the hypothesis is met. Then we can apply it. So let's get to it with what is the integral test. Okay, so we have our nice sequence here, a sub n which is defined to be this function at certain values, n, right? And we need f to be three things. And the first step is that we need f to be a nice continuous function. We'd like it to be positive. And then finally, we need f to be decreasing. So continuous, positive, decreasing on our interval from 1 to infinity, or 1 and larger. If these conditions are met, then the claim is that we can tie the fates together of uh, an improper integral and our series. So that's to say, if the integral from one to infinity, so like you see a nice improper integral of f of x dx is convergent, then the series is convergent. So this is the series from one to infinity of a sub n. Likewise, if this improper integral is divergent, then the series is divergent. So again, we've essentially tied their fates together Okay, so let me kind of go over a nice little picture here about why the integral test makes sense, why this is kind of an intuitive theorem. Um, so let me go ahead and I'll draw some axes here and I'll draw my nice function. And remember when my function uh, is one and larger, we need it to be continuous, positive, decreasing. So, okay, there we go. So we have, uh, when it's one and larger, right, we have continuous, positive, decreasing. All right, so now let's remember that the integral from 1 to infinity of f of x dx is the area trapped between the curve and the x-axis. So it's this green area right here. And it goes on forever off to infinity. Okay, now let's try to draw in our sequence. So I'm going to draw in the integer values here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. And our sequence terms here, a sub 1, a sub 2, a sub 3, right? These are supposed to be the function's height at integers, n, right? Our sequence is equal to f sub n. Okay, so now let's think about the series, right? The series is adding all these up. Well, one way you can think about that is by adding the area of rectangles, right? So here's a nice rectangle. It has height a sub 1 and it has width one. So according to the area formula for rectangles, length times width, right? So we could say the length is a sub one, the width is one, so it's one. Likewise, here are a lot more rectangles, right? The second one here has height a sub two, width one, so it has area a sub two. And then we have a three, a four, a five, so on and so forth. So you can think of the series as this nice orange area right here. It goes on forever and ever and ever. So now looking at these things, you can say, okay, the orange area isn't exactly the same as the green area, but it is pretty close, right? So the integral and the series aren't the exact same. They wouldn't converge to the same number, but the claim is that they're close enough that if one heads towards a finite number, that the other will head towards a finite number. That this little purple area right here, these little differences, are small. They're small enough that they're, uh, they won't change whether or not it converges or not. Okay, so let me try to draw a function here um, that isn't continuous, so that's the condition that I'm going to break. It's not going to be continuous, it's going to be positive and decreasing, or at least it's going to have negative slope everywhere. And uh, I'd like to show you how I can break the integral test if the hypotheses aren't met. Okay, so the main hypothesis that I'm breaking here is continuous, but the claim is you could come up with a counterexample um, if you didn't have positive or you didn't have decreasing. Okay. So the idea here is that I'm going to have a function. It's going to decrease. And then at the next integer values, let's say there's two. Same thing. It's going to start over back at the top here. And it's going to decrease. 
The claim is I'm going to try to do this so that the areas under these curves get smaller and smaller and smaller, but they start off at the same height here. So something like this. Okay, oh, oops. Okay, so again, let me go ahead and draw in my integral, right, so the area under the curve. Notice that this curve is positive, it's above the x-axis, it's decreasing in the sense that the slope, wherever that's defined, is negative. Okay, so there's my green, there's my integral, and let's say that, you know, I can do this in such a way that it actually converges, right? These get smaller and smaller and smaller. Now, comparison, here's the series, right? A1, A2, A3, A4. Each one of these has width 1 and height, that is the sequence term. And now this orange area in this case, well, this is the exact same area over and over and over again. Let's say it's area two or something like that. So it's like I'm adding two plus two plus two plus two plus two, and I kept on doing that for all time, right? Going on to infinity. And this one certainly will not converge. So I have positive, I have decreasing. The only thing that I broke here is it's not continuous, and you can see that the integral test does not hold. So it's important, we need these three hypotheses. We need to make sure that all of them are satisfied in order to have the integral test. So that's gonna be a big part of all of our problems is showing, hey, we have a continuous positive and decreasing function, and now we can apply the integral test. So let's try it out here with an example. So I have this nice case, uh, determine if the series from zero to infinity of one over n squared plus one converges or diverges. Now notice that I'm changed, uh, this lower bound here, that I'm not going from 1 to infinity, but I'm actually going from 0. So basically, the only change here is that when I do the improper integral, I'm going to go from 0 to infinity. Okay, so that'll be 0 to infinity. That's really going to be the only change. And likewise, you could change this to 2 or 3 or 4, anything like that, uh, if the problem wanted you to. Okay, and one thing you could think about this is if technically you wanted to be correct, right, you could break this up into first when you plug in zero and then when you plug in one and larger. So that's why this idea works. That's why you can change the starting value here. So this is zero for the first term and then at one and bigger, one to infinity. So, okay, let's get rid of this. And we wanna set ourselves up to use the integral test. So I'm going to go ahead and define the function. So the function is, well, exactly what we have here. f of n is equal to 1 over n squared plus 1. If you'd like to, you can use x's. Okay, and we have to state that f is continuous. Right? The only reason that it wouldn't be continuous is if we were dividing by 0 in this case. Uh, but since n squared is positive and 1 is positive, we have no chance of this being 0. So it is continuous. After that, we have to say, uh, and with a little bit of justification is nice, that f is positive. And again, the numerator is positive, right? The numerator is 1 in this case. And the denominator is positive. So let me go ahead and write this down. So since 1 is greater than 0 and the denominator, n squared plus 1, is greater than 0. And then finally, the third one, and this is usually the most difficult, f is decreasing. So those are my three conditions for the integral test. It's continuous. Usually that one doesn't take too much to prove. It's positive. Again, just a few words here. But decreasing usually takes a little bit. So OK, why is this decreasing? Well, let's go ahead and compare n squared to n plus 1 squared, right? Because n is greater than or equal to 1, we know that n plus 1 squared is going to be greater than n squared, right? So note, n is greater than or equal to 1. Okay, now let's add 1 to both sides. Here we are, adding 1 to both sides. And then finally, it's like cross multiplication, but in reverse. Or if you'd like, we can divide both sides by n squared plus 1, and both sides by n plus 1 squared plus 1. So if I divide both sides by n squared plus 1, you can see on the left-hand side, it just kind of cancels out. On the right-hand side, we get a denominator. And if I divide both sides by this n plus 1 squared plus 1, on the left, sorry, on the right-hand side, it cancels out. And on the left-hand side, we get a denominator. So now you can see, well, this is exactly our function, right? 
And when we have a bigger term, this n plus 1 squared plus 1, right, that this is smaller than 1 over n squared plus 1. So we've successfully shown that it is decreasing. Okay. So that being said, we can now apply the integral test. So let's go ahead and look at not the series, but rather the integral from 0 to infinity of, and we'll switch to x's here, so 1 over x squared plus 1 dx. Well, how do I integrate this thing? Well, the first thing is that it is an improper integral, so we can go ahead and use the definition of improper integrals to say this is the limit as t approaches infinity of the integral from 0 to t of our function. Okay, so again, how do I integrate 1 over x squared plus 1? Well, hopefully we stare at this and we recognize that this is exactly arctangent, or if you'd like, tangent inverse. So here's our nice tangent inverse. And now let's go ahead and plug in t and 0. So if I plugged in t, well, we just get tangent inverse of t. If we plug in 0, well, tangent inverse of 0 is exactly 0. So it'd be subtracting away 0. So let's just go ahead and write it as tangent inverse of t. Now, as t gets very large, the question is, what does tangent inverse head towards? So we need to remember, what does tangent inverse look like? Well, it looks something like this, right? It's uh, tangent, but it's been flipped over the line y equals x. So everywhere there used to be a vertical asymptote, there's now a horizontal asymptote. I guess I shouldn't say everywhere, but at negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2, we now have horizontal asymptotes. So that's the big thing here. As t gets very, very large, we're heading towards pi over 2. So we've successfully shown that this function right here meets the criteria of the integral test, and we've shown that the improper integral converges, and in fact it converges to pi over 2. So therefore, by the integral test, we know that the series must also converge. We don't know what exactly it converges towards, but we know that it converges. All right, and with that, that's probably a good place for us to take a break. As you can see, the integral test takes a little bit to get set up, right? It has a lot of hypotheses. We actually have to check all of these. Uh, and then once you get it set up, the integral test isn't so bad. We just have to remember how to do improper integrals. Okay, I'll see you next time.